This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. In the 13th century, Europe became a theatre of combat, conquest and striving for survival. As the Mongol horde started spreading to Eastern and Central Europe and European countries prepared to fight. But what made the Mongol army so dreadful and efficient? Often time when people study the effectiveness of the Mongols in combat in war, they mostly focus on the sort of weapons they used, the sort of armor that they were using, and also of course the idea of mounted archery. But there are other aspects that I believe have a more significant role in trying to understand and gain our answer. At that time the Mongol army was a brilliantly led and exceptionally well organized military machine capable of outstanding military feats. This brought to the clash of the West and the East. But why? were the Mongols so difficult to stop. Mongol commanders had a very professional way of utilizing soldiers, resources, materials and time effectively. Not only they were able to weave complex plans often consisting of multiple and simultaneous operations, but they could also adjust these plans and adapt them depending on the results of battle engagements, and reallocate their resources depending on how the battle engagements panned out. This very sophisticated and advanced way of approaching warfare and conquest is what you would call operational vision. The Mongols were nomadic pastoralists. This already sets them aside from the Han, the main Chinese ethnicity, who were instead sedimentary farmers. These nomadic traditions were the basis of the method of war used by the Mongolian Empire. A people so used and accustomed to riding, for whom riding would have been a natural endeavor. However, it came at a cost. The Mongolian pony did not require barley or grain, but it did require grass, keeping in mind that generally speaking on average every soldier would have three to four ponies. So one of the reasons such an army was so well organized is because it needed to be, in order to provide the fodder to keep the animals alive and combat ready. Before moving to the next section, I would like to talk about the sponsor that made this video possible, namely The Great Courses Plus. Now, The Great Courses Plus is probably the perfect sponsor, both for me as a person, but also for the kind of channel that I run and for the kind of audience that I have. In other words, you know the ones. Now, the reason why I say that is because, as you know, apart from being a YouTuber, I'm also an educator and a teacher. So I do teach as my daily job, apart from making videos on YouTube. And The Great Courses Plus is an excellent addition to my own kind of studies, personal studies, but also to the lessons and lectures that I have. And that is because it contains courses taught by professors at an extremely professional level. Through your subscription, you get access to a huge library with over 11,000 videos. And these videos, they are really good. Now, when I started watching these courses, I was really impressed with the quality of the information presented. One course I really liked by Professor Kenneth Hearth is Barbarians of the Steps, and I strongly recommend it to you. Of course, I also used some of the information from this course, particularly the section when he speaks about Genghis Khan and the passion he puts into the, you can, in fact, the professor himself says that he uh, fears that sometimes they might think he's a sort of fanboy, that these are not the exact words that he uses, but uh, he does go so much in details about the life of Genghis Khan, both as a military leader, but as a political figure and as a historical figure. And he gives so much information that I just rewatched it three times per episode. And clearly the course doesn't just focus on the Mongols, but it also talks about the steps in general, about the conquest and the fight and the, and the battles between the Islamic forces and powers against the Mongols. It's fascinating. Now, The Great Courses Plus has given you a great offer with a free trial. And at the same time, by subscribing to The Great Courses Plus, you will be supporting the Metatron channel and my production here on site. So it's a win-win for everyone. Please visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Metatron or click the link in the description below to start your free trial today.
In this video we're mostly focusing on knights versus mongols, but it is important to realize that medieval armies were usually made of several different kinds of troops. The sort of armies the European powers and countries could field in the Middle Ages were very diverse. You would have knights, yes, but also men-at-arms, infantry, archers, now, the Mongols are specifically fighting mid-13th century knights. It is important to realize that all of these are knights and you can appreciate that they are very, very diverse in the sort of equipment that they can use. It's very easy, in fact, to be rather anachronistic. For instance, the sort of breastplate that I'm wearing now, so this one here, this is a, an invention that would have been very futuristic for the knights of the mid 13th century. This is a late 14th century breastplate, specifically. So in this section of the video, we're going to discuss the sort of evolution that armor went through in Europe from the first kind of knights, so the first kind of mounted warriors, such as the Norman knights during the Battle of Hastings, for example, in 1066, all the way up to the gendarmes, or the French gendarmes of the late 16th century. After this section, we will be diving into a section dedicated to the Horde, so the Mongols, the sort of strategy, politics and the events that led to the invasion of Europe in 1241. An example of a knight of the 11th century would be the sort of mounted warriors that fought for the Duchy of Normandy, for instance, in the Battle of Hastings in 1066. At this time, if you were to fight a knight, he would have been wearing a conical nasal helmet, a male hauberk, usually long with a rider split, with the arm only being partially covered, generally speaking, mid-sleeve length. In this period, the male coif, male hood that protects the head, underneath the helmet is integral to the hauberk, it's not detached. A 12th century knight is similar, but the male now covers more of the arm. It's also very well tailored and it tapers all the way down to the wrists. We see no hand protection in the iconography. Towards the end of the 12th century, nasal helmets are still used, but new shapes are also available, such as a round shape or protruding at the front. In the mid-12th century, shorts appear, so the sort of male protection of the leg, which at first only protects the front. It is at the end of the 12th century that hands start to be protected, either with individual finger gauntlets attached to the male hauberk, not detached, or more commonly, mittens, which tend to be more constant in iconography. Still, in the early 13th century, male is the prevalent form of protection of knights. We start having the development of primitive great helms. It is in the mid 13th century that we have the fully developed flat top great helm. So this is the sort of helmet that most likely knights would have been wearing at this time against the Mongols. At the end of the 13th century, however, we have the development of a new improved form of the great helm, which is the sugar loaf, which has a conical shape, which helps making sure the hits would glance away. One characteristic of 13th century great helms, though, is that they are smaller than the 14th century counterpart. And that is because in the 13th century, the Great Helm, in all of its forms, it's a standalone helmet. Something that you put on your male coif. More on that later. Another helmet that we might have seen in this period would have been the kettle hat, or the early forms of kettle hat. Early forms would have a longer brim. My reproduction here is a late 15th century kettle hat, so the brim is a lot smaller and it looks a lot more like a salad. Also, it is in the mid 13th century that we start seeing separated male coifs as a form of protection, detached from the rest of the hauberk. It is in the late 13th century that we have fully enclosed male legs and knights start experimenting with half greaves. At the end of the 13th century, we have the development of the first coat of plates. In the 14th century, the male hauberk becomes a hauberkian, so it's smaller in size. Small spaulders of plate start protecting the shoulders. And finally, it is in the mid 14th century that the plate limb partial protection starts to appear. But we will have to wait for the late 14th century to see full plate limbs and the beginning of the breastplate. The great helm by this time has become a very big helmet that is used in conjunction with a smaller helmet, granting much more protection, usually worn over a secret helm at first or a bassinet later. The bassinet as a helmet begins in the mid 14th century and then it is in the early 15th century that we have the development of breastplate and backplate. Voiders, discreet males sewn onto a garment, usually the arming doublet, replace male shirt. Generally speaking, Italians would still wear full male shirt. But it is in 1420 that the full plate suit of armor, including breastplate, backplate and fold, is created. And by 1485, during the circuitless period, European armorers reach the peak of full plate armor and smithing technology. As we move into the 16th century, we will see even greater development, allowing for more protective harnesses that by this time can use plate even 
for the joints and other areas that would have been weak areas up to now. Facing the Mongols at this time didn't just mean facing one tribe, the Mongols proper, but it meant having to do with a huge confederation of unified warrior tribes that were exceptionally dangerous and that were unified violently prior to the invasion of Europe, but also prior to the attacks against Islam or the invasion of, against the Russian principalities, that were unified violently by one man, Temujin, who will later become Genghis Khan, in other words, the Universal Lord. The unification of the great tribes was probably one of the most important geopolitical events of this period and the prerogative to the expansions of the Mongol Empire, the Tatars, often called Tartars by the Europeans in reference to the classical concept of hell, the Naimans, the Merkits, the Kerates. Up to the moment of unification and political stability created by Genghis Khan, all of these tribes had been in constant tribal warfare one against the other, which is one of the reasons why the Jin dynasty, the Chinese, never really considered them to be too much of a threat. And they, in fact, probably underestimated what it meant that these tribes, all of the tribes of the steppes, had unified, creating the Horde. So Genghis Khan unified the tribes, but it will be his sons and grandsons that will uh, begin the expansions to the West. Now, it's interesting, and I'd like to mention very briefly how the Russian princes tried to stop the Mongol horde from advancing, and one by one, the Mongols not only completely devastated the Russian armies of the Russian principalities, but they also burned to the ground almost every single city in the Russian or main city in the Russian territories, including the, at the time, extremely beautiful and exquisite Kiev. Now, one thing that I'd like to underline, which I think is poignant to our discussion, is the fact that, yes, the Mongol army was mostly cavalry, mounted archers and heavy lancers. However, they also used Persian and Chinese engineers, and they made use of the Cumans after they subjugated them. So, generally speaking, when the Mongols conquer a territory, they will use the people that they have conquered, adding them to their armies, and it was because of the Chinese engineers and the Persian engineers that they managed to literally scorch the Russian towns whenever the Russians understood that facing the Mongols in open field was suicide. But still, even trying to stay close and remain within the confines of their cities was not safe because of the engineers that the Mongols had access to then managed to burn their cities because, again, these cities was mostly, were mostly fortified with wood. So, the Mongol horde led by Batu swipes through what today's Iran utilizes the grasslands which were absolutely ideal for their kind of cavalry for the fact that they were mostly mounted and then they go into the russian territories and completely annihilate any resistance but information at this point starts to become vague. Of course, the Mongols send their spies, send their um, scouts to collect as much information about the political situation in Central and Eastern Europe, which is what they did with the Russians and it's what they did against Islam. It was part of their assessing before mobilization, but they don't know a lot. They are aware that we have a Pope, which for them probably was just an emperor, considering, you know, mandate of heaven that the Chinese had, that's probably how they saw the Pope. But one thing that they knew that shaped their strategy of attack and conquest in 1241 was the fact that Hungary and Poland and Silesia could 
unite to help each other and they did not want that to happen and that's why they begin an expedition after reassessing re-equipping resetting the army and gaining support and new troops from the east from Karakorum they decide to move into a simultaneous double invasion but another thing that is really important apart from where they mobilize and how they mobilize their armies is also the sort of psychological warfare that, they, that the Mongols used against their opponents the atrocities that even by 13th century standards were absolutely unheard of that the Mongols did to their conquered lands. So in other words what they did is that whenever they would find a city and this city would resist they would level it to the ground, they would massacre and butcher everyone and they would make sure that these things would be heard by other countries so that the next city that they would go and conquer rather than going through what the previous target of the Mongols had to go through, they would just decide to peacefully surrender. So the Europeans were also under this kind of psychological pressure. And yet, they choose to resist. Batu, Genghis Khan's grandson, understands that he needs to divide the army. He takes four major columns and moves into Hungary. At the same time, the rest of the army is being moved by General Subutai. Subutai is going to the north, is going to Poland. But why does he do that? He does that because he wants to make sure that Poland, but also the Teutonic Knights, couldn't possibly rescue the King of Hungary during their invasion. Because they knew and fully understood that even though they were exceptionally good at fighting, having to deal with both the Teutonic Knights, the Polish Knights, the Hungarian knights would have been too much even for the Mongol horde, so they split them. They attacked them separately and simultaneously. Subutai faces the army of Duke Boleslav the Chaste of Krakow, and they destroy him. The same way the army of Duke Henry the Pious of Silesia is annihilated. Why can the Mongols destroy European armies? Well, the main reason that we have to understand is that when we talk about Subutai, when we talk about the generals and generally speaking the family of Genghis Khan, we are talking about war veterans. These are people, all the soldiers, all the generals, that have already gone through the campaign against Islam, through the uh, campaign against the Russians. So these are all veterans. Battle-hardened soldiers, battle-hardened generals are not easy to fight, particularly for one specific reason that I noticed that a lot of people don't take into consideration. The areas where they are fighting of Europe. You see, both Poland, but mostly Hungary at the time, was not fortified. The Mongols fight in open grassland, which is perfect for them and perfect for the kind of army that they have. In that natural equilibrium, the Hungarian and Polish armies don't stand a chance. But the Mongols are not invincible. In fact, there is one battle that I think is very significant. April 10th and April 11th of 1241, the army of King Bela IV faces the Mongols. This is a famous battle because of the take of a bridge, a tactical mistake made by King Bela, made by the Hungarian that gives the upper hand and the advantage to the Mongols that take them by surprise. But it is interesting to see that even though the Hungarians lose against the Mongols, the Mongols sustain very, very high casualties. A lot of Mongols die in that battle. Why? Because of the courage and professionalism of the Hungarian knights. An incredible effectiveness of the Templars. Even though the Templars were an insignificant number. Elite European troops perform exceptionally well but the infantry panics and runs away. That's why I say it's not really just knights versus Mongols. Medieval infantry wasn't as professional as Roman infantry. So the only real pros in a European army at the time were the knights, particularly the Holy Orders. So the Mongols win and yet the expansion stops. Now the reason why the expansion stops are multiple. The main reason, and I agree with that, is the fact that the great Khan, the son of Genghis Khan, Ogadai, dies. All the Mongols go back, they leave Europe and they go back to Mongolia because there is going to be an election. Um, but that is not the only reason why they don't continue the expansion, because generally speaking the idea that the Mongol had, the plan was, go as west as you can. You know, until you see the sea, just keep conquering, destroying, plundering and raiding. But could they have done that if they hadn't gone back to Mongolia? And my answer is no. 
So one thing at a time, why did they go back to Mongolia? Why was it so important to be part of this election and why did it take so long? Well, first and foremost, Mongolian elections or their cans weren't like situation where you go, you vote, somebody else, somebody else votes and then you got a majority. No, that's a democratic system, that's a republican constitution, that's not what the Mongols had. For them, the election of the Great Khan had to be unanimous. So you can understand that because of the political inner fragmentation and all the different personal interests that every single one of Genghis Khan has had, this already was going to be a really, really difficult and tough situation. Batu also wanted to make sure that his voice would be heard. So for him, it was more important to go back, try to influence these elections as much as possible than it would have been to just continue plundering and gaining land and then lose basically all his power, depending on who was going to become the new Great Khan. But another fundamental reason why the Mongols could not continue even if this hadn't happened, and this is of course my personal thesis and I'd like to hear your opinion in the comments, is the fact that the Mongols up to that point had never encountered fortified castles. In fact, and this is history, the moment that they start seeing the fortified stone masonry castles, they stop. They stopped even before the political inner fragmentation because the Mongol army was a very specialized army. It was exceptionally good at fighting in the fields, but it was not meant to attack castles. Now, one thing that is important to say is that yes, Eastern Europe didn't have many castles. Hungary, not even less than that. But Germany at the time had tens of thousands of castles. So thinking that the Mongols could have just as easily conquered the entirety of Germany, the entirety of France, and Italy, although it wasn't Italy at the time, but you know what I, what I mean, the Italian area is unreasonable. The Mongol army was not made to capture and siege castles. Secondly, an attack to the Vatican would have meant that the Pope could have called for all the holy orders from everywhere, from all the Christian kingdoms in the East, in the Middle East, um, the Templar Knights from France, from Italy, from Germany, from everywhere could have all united to defend the Pope. In my opinion, even though the Mongols were definitely the bane of Europe, it was the bane of Central and Eastern Europe. But Western Europe was a different thing and the Mongols knew that much more powerful countries resided on the Western section. And they knew that that would have taken years of intelligence and possibly a complete reorganization of the entire concept of the Mongol army. So my opinion is, is that if Ogadai hadn't died, probably Europe would have been split. All of this to say, there are a lot of things that need to be considered. It is not just a matter of the knights used lances, had steel helmets and iron mail shirts, and the Mongols used lamella armor, uh, iron helmets and, uh, and, and bows, and so the Mongols won over the knights because whatever. It's not just a matter of equipment versus equipment, and not even just a matter of the Mongols used the retreat tactics and the, and the knights weren't, weren't fast enough. That's too reductive. There are a lot of factors at play that need to be considered. Mongols attacking in the 11th century? Absolutely. Mongols attacking in the 12th century, 13th century? Absolutely. But if you have a Mongol army fighting a late 15th century or a late 16th century European army, it would have been a completely different situation even for a field battle, not just for siege warfare. And that is because at that time, by that time, European technology had become, in my opinion, the most advanced in terms of warfare. In fact, if you think of the French gendarmes, which I will make a dedicated video because they're absolutely fascinating, uh, the only thing that could really stop those incredibly heavy armored knights was the Spanish technique pike and shot, having gunners shooting at the knights while the pikemen prevented the charge. So probably the Mongol army would have been incredibly different because the 13th century Mongol army couldn't beat a 15th or 16th century European, Western European army, in my humble opinion. But of course, by that time, if the Mongol empire had kept growing and didn't have the political contrasts that it did and eventually fragment it, and then probably we would have seen a completely different, and who knows, even more dreadful Mongolian army. But that's probably for a different video. All right, noble ones. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're yet not members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And don't forget to check out the Great Courses Plus utilizing the link in the description below. And remember, the Metatron 
has spread his wings. Goodbye. Okay,